All right. So this week is going to be all about boards and projects and like this ecosystem of weird electronics things that can be used to create basically whatever it is you can think up. And we're going to go through the mechanisms of what those are, make some sense of that because it, it is a deep and rich ecosystem that's built up over, I would say, the past eight to 10 years. And so now stepping into it can be kind of tricky. So we're going to give you some access points, some places to grab a hold. And then this will be our first like in earnest electronics projects where we use more than just getting LED to turn on and off. And so we're going to go through some generic terms, things that are really helpful to know as we get going. We're going to talk about the three major electronics teams. And there's definitely teams that have developed over this time frame. They're not competitive. They're collaborative teams, but, but they're different camps, I guess. And then we're going to go through the classes of add-ons that you can have that will work to try and get your electronics going and how you can attach those things beyond just the Arduino itself or just a Raspberry Pi. And then we'll go through some suggestions and soldering and wall power and batteries. And these might be actually a little out of order. I rearranged things just before we hopped on and I, I did not rearrange them here, but those are the topics. So here's our generic terms. And there's, there's three that I really wanna make sure that we have solid. The first one is logic level. And this is something that I, I wanna make sure that you can see now because it's, it can be sneaky. Um, the logic level is the voltage that's used as the, the logic voltage or the high. So when you type in Arduino digital pin or digital write high, it's at five volts on an Arduino. If you do the same analogous thing on a Raspberry Pi, it's 3.3 volts. And while that doesn't directly matter when you're working entirely in one ecosystem, it will matter if you ever try and cross or if you try and get pieces that weren't uh, specifically designed for that platform. And we'll see that in a little while. But logic level is good to know that that is just a, a term that exists. And it's good to know that they have different voltages on different platforms. And, and it is a little inconsistent. The only, because there's many different flavors of Arduino. Arduino is usually five, but it can be 3.3. But there's, there's a lot of details, but just knowing that that exists and check for it is good. Microcontroller is another one. The Arduino is a microcontroller board. Specifically, it's the ATmega328P chip. And so a microcontroller is specifically a thing that's definitely less than a computer. And so that's where the microcontroller camp lives. Uh, and that's, that's different from a single board computer, like a Raspberry Pi, a BeagleBone, or even I would say like a Chromebook or some really simple laptops, you could probably classify in this single board computer if inside it's just one board uh, that's like the, the tiniest little motherboard you would ever have seen. And so those have microprocessors on them, which are different from microcontrollers. They're like a full processor. Sometimes they're even systems on a chip, which as if you go deep in the weeds for uh, integrated circuits developments as we move forward and forward throughout the years, we're getting closer and closer to systems on a chip in lots of places. Um, but microprocessors are getting are, are what do the thinking on a single board computer. Then usually there's some memory and some other stuff. But those are three good terms to know. Now, those, those terms get applied within and across these three major hobby electronics teams that are important to know about. So here are the three teams. We've got Arduino, which is over here on the left. That was originally developed by a team of four, three Italians and a Spaniard, uh, so that art students could learn electronics in a weekend. And I wanna put that in big air quotes. Um, but they were one of the first major players into this hobby electronics space uh, that made it accessible, that brought in all of the pieces so that it's a thing that you could learn over a period of maybe a month or two to do some easy things that you could have a weekend project that those pieces came together that nicely. And so Arduino was one of the first players. Yeah, a weekend without sleep, definitely. But the weekend was, was totally the thing that they were doing. And so there's many pieces that have been born from there that I would say live in the microcontroller space, like little bits and makey makey, a teensy, a micro bit. Those are all sort of in the Arduino camp. Then there's the Raspberry Pi, which is based out, uh, it was started by Eben Upton uh, specifically and developed in England as a learning electronics and code by tinkering platform. And 
he's a he's a neat guy. I actually have met him when doing a Raspberry Pi training. I'm Raspberry Pi certified, and and basically Raspberry Pi is targeted at the educational space. But as people have over the years learned the the usefulness of them because they're just simple computers that you can spin up and then spin down. You can do all sorts of things with them. They're not hard to reset. They're cheap. You know, thirty five dollars is cheap for a computer overall. Uh, they've really expanded and now they have Raspberry Pi compute modules, which are kind of intended for not the educational market. They're intended for slapping into the back of a giant presentation screen and being able to have a, a fleet of things that you can play around with or having a nice touch screen at the entryway to your business. So there, there are some deeper applications for Raspberry Pi for sure. And then Adafruit is the third camp. This was started by Lee Moore Fried. She was an MIT graduate uh, she started this company in New York City, and I, I hope we can all go visit there someday. But the, the key is that she and her team have started, they started off really collecting and, and curating all of these different electronics pieces together. So they were easy to buy, easy to use, and they had the learning platform that was really just knocked it out of the park. And so the Adafruit team really did a great job there. And recently they started their own boards because they realized that their customers wanted to have a thing that would be on a battery and it would have a full solution. And, and they thought that Python was maybe an easier language to learn and use than C++. So they made some pivots and they have their entire whole line of boards, the feather boards and a few others that are based around things that they've built up themselves. Still heavily involved with the other two, but they do have their own line of boards that kind of makes them their own camp at this point, at, at you know, in 2021. So there, it's good to know that these are the three categories that we're gonna be playing in. But if you wanted to compare them, I would say that Arduino is easily the most like raw and hard to break. They're, they're hardy um, in Arduino V laptop. I have seen Arduino win and the laptop die. It's, it doesn't happen often. You gotta do something really wrong to make that happen. But Arduinos are just rock solid little pieces of hardware. And if an Arduino can do it, because they don't have a ton question? of processing power, everything else is basically got too much brains to go for it. So if you're trying to really minimize the amount that you're spending on processing, the Arduino is going to be the one that's at the bottom of that pile. And then even more, if you get if you can get down to the, the Teensy chips, like Wogata was using. But I would say that most projects that people bring to the table for hobby electronics, they're really not that computationally complicated, but they can be really entertaining. And so this is probably going to be a safe place for a lot of people to work. Let's see. Yeah, oh. quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I may have missed this. Sorry. On the on the earlier slides, was the way you introduced them sort of um, was that chronological, like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Adafruit? I I think it is came to be. It is loosely chronological. I I would Raspberry Pi and Arduino are probably pretty close for which one came first. Um, they're definitely the order that I came to learn them, which is about, I was close to when they were coming into being. I think Arduino was maybe 2012, Raspberry Pi was maybe a year or two later, and then they've definitely been growing since then. Adafruit would have been a little, a touch later, but they were early into this game for delivering things, but it, it's pretty much chronological. Okay. Cool, that was gonna be my other question was, is about how long, so perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Arduino is the, the hardy uh, basic one. Adafruit's Feather is really good at handling batteries, especially rechargeable LiPo batteries. It has usually more of a brain than an Arduino does, like more processing power, more memory, and probably less pins. Since Adafruit has developed CircuitPython, almost all of their examples are in Python, but typically their boards are still programmable in C++. But if you're on their website and you're like, looking around and you find a project that you want to do, probably all of the example code is going to be in Python, which is, which is in no way a problem. And it's a totally reasonable language to learn, but it's, it's just another language from what we've been doing in this particular class. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's definitely a language that if you can do C++, the transition to Python will be a short one, but it may not be the kind of thing that you want to do unexpectedly. Just know that it's a different language. And then Raspberry Pi is really a, a powerhouse uh, because you, like, as I said, they've started to develop out um, things for business. So it's really good when you're connecting a project to the internet or if you need a lot of processing or if you really wanna learn how the whole computer works, they have a lot for that, but it's, it's not a real-time operating system. 
which is what RTOS is. And that's a, there's a really good video that explains what a real-time operating system. And so a good question is what did people do before Arduino, Raspberry Pi and Adafruit? And so prior to these, the hobby electronics market was much, much smaller. And so it existed, but it was, it was a lot smaller. And the, the 555 timer was a really big player. And those just sort of like click things back and forth, but it was much harder to get into this space. And I think that Arduino really tipped, tipped that over for microcontrollers where they, they took the like five or six different pieces that you need and they put it all together. You would have needed like a, an electrical engineering degree to make all of those pieces connect. But the people that did the open source Arduino work, they really packaged it nicely so that you, you didn't uh, and it became possible. Prior to Arduino, it would have been much, much harder to do this. And Raspberry Pi did basically the same thing, uh, but they were working in the computer Linux computer space. And so it was a really similar thing. They have a, a lot of the same ideas, but it, it was a lot harder. There was a, a space back in the, in I think the 80s when Eben Upton himself was talking about it, where you could sort of get at the hardware when you had parallel ports coming out of the back of computers, which are the really long ones with lots of pins. It was easier to drive a single individual pin up or down, but then that sort of went away as USB showed up and through the 90s and early 2000s, the, the computer space became something that was just entirely dominated for and by engineers. And then people bought computers because they were useful, but tinkering with them was a lot harder. But it was in this sort of renaissance of the Arduino Raspberry Pi, and then shortly after Adafruit time, where all of these pieces started to open back up to commonplace hacking that didn't require an advanced degree. It sort of brought it back into the realm of things that became approachable. You could have always used an AVR ISP programmer if you wanted to. It was just a much smaller number of people that were doing it. So I think that that's probably when it came into the, the makerspace vernacular. But those are the three, and that's, that's how I would compare them to each other um, for Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and the Adafruit Feather platform. And they're really, they're each great, and they have their own spaces that are worth playing in. I've used them all, uh, and they, they are, they're each good for their own thing. And so if you're ever curious about which one to use when, just ask, and it'd be good to have a discussion about it. Um, but there's many things that are common about them. So we're gonna go through sort of the classes of add-ons that you'd have to these different platforms. We're gonna talk about these three categories, shields and hats and wings. And then we're gonna talk about breakout boards. And then we're gonna talk about bare components because they're, they're different like levels of attachments that you can have for these things. And so just putting these together, the shields, hats and wings, these are things like the example board that I've given to all of you and for Arduino, they're called shields. For Raspberry Pi, they're hats. And for Adafruit, they're wings. But they're basically a circuit board that you just attach on to the other circuit board. So in these cases, you can see they, they sit on top. Hence the shield, it kind of protects the Arduino. Right? It's protecting the chip underneath. These things sit on top of the Arduino right here and, and maybe off to the side. This one sits over. This is a motor shield. Sometimes you buy them and you need to solder things in place. But usually, that's not true anymore. Uh, most of the time they come to you soldered. And then these are Raspberry Pi hats. The, the reason that they're not cross compatible is just because the pins are different. Arduino has these two strips that are really separated from each other. Raspberry Pi has a two by 20 connector. It used to be a two by 13, I think in the first round of Raspberry Pi, uh, but now they're two by 20. And that even is true for the Raspberry Pi zero, these little tiny ones. And so you can, you can do all sorts of things with these, but basically it's the same idea, but in different platforms. And so the Adafruit has wings, the Adafruit feather has wings, and I just needed to stop jamming photos in here, but they, they're basically the same thing for the Adafruit platform. And basically these, I really like, they're solved problems is what I would put them in as, because they tidy up all the loose ends for you. You buy one of these and it's gonna work exactly how the instructions say it's gonna work. There's lots of different companies that make them. Uh, this one that's glowy down here is a Raspberry Pi made hat. It's the Sense hat that's made by the official Raspberry Pi Foundation. Arduino makes some of their own like first tier boards. And then there's lots of companies that, that make them also. So I think this is the Seed Studio logo, which is a big Chinese company for it. The gear with an open bottom is open hardware. It's that it's open. 
source. And so there's, there's lots of different people that make these sorts of shields. Like down here is the unicorn hat made by someone else. But they should come with a full set of instructions because there's a lot packed into a shield usually. And you need some information about what's connected where and what pins do you need to vary to get the, the motor to turn or the lights to blink. Those sorts of things should all come pre-packaged with a shield. These are gonna be the lowest barrier to entry where like the Arduino in the middle here, if you want an Arduino to make something move, then you buy a, a motor hat, you put it on a motor shield, you put it on top of the Arduino, you write a little bit of code and the motor's moving. So these are nice, easy solutions because they're all buttoned up for you. All you need to do is find the instructions and maybe even the example sketches, install the libraries and upload the example sketch and it should just run. So there's a lot of niceness to having a shield, a hat or a wing because they just solve a lot of problems for you. But they're platform specific. So that's a downside that you can't use an Arduino shield for a Raspberry Pi whenever you'd like to. But next up there's breakout boards. So breakout boards do give cross-platform use. It's, it's often possible, usually possible with a breakout board. And you can see these are much smaller. They usually have rows of pins like this and uh, SparkFun makes a lot of these. So you can see a lot of the red boards, those are SparkFun products. And so SparkFun makes a ton of them. And these would have little areas where you'd either put in pins to stick it in a breadboard or you might solder in wires so that can have wires attaching it to the Arduino or to the Raspberry Pi. And so there's, there's a range of ways where you might end up connecting these things together. But these are good ways to add functionality that you couldn't get access to either or another way or just to be able to have sort of interoperability. So like there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different options and some of them like this is the, a micro SD card breakout. That's a really nice one. There's a, some of them like this is a humidity sensor. Some of them are a little harder to decode unless you know the part number, but like this part number here looks like it's a accelerometer probably. Uh, or maybe some sort of thing with orientation because it's labeled for X, Y, Z, so you know which direction they are. This would give you an opportunity to have that sort of motion. And so you could use that on an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, but you've got to be careful that your logic levels work. But here's an interesting breakout board, this one right here with the four little things across it. Those are transistors, uh, probably MOSFET transistors, and they are this is a logic level shifting board so that you can go between ecosystems if you want. If you have something that you really like as a breakout for Arduino, but you wanna use it for Raspberry Pi, as long as it'll work on, uh, you can have this communicate back and forth through a board like this, just to make that, make that connection, which is really neat. And so a logic level shifter would let you go from the five volt logic of an Arduino, and it would adjust all those logic levels down to 3.3 volts for the Raspberry Pi so that they can talk to each other. And it does that in such a way that communication can happen back and forth, but that you don't have five volts accidentally go into the Raspberry Pi, which would be a bad day for your Raspberry Pi, or 3.3 volts coming from a Raspberry Pi to a, a, an item that needs five, and the five volts aren't there, so it doesn't quite know what to do with it. It's an interesting problem that you have only when you're trying to go from platform to platform. And so a good example might be if you're having something with 3.3 volts, try and communicate with a USB port. Like this is a USB mini plug. That's a breakout. If you ever want to have USB power, like you might need to think about what logic level is your data line being communicated at and how's that going to work? So, so there's moments where with some research on how each one of these is going to happen, you get some interesting ability, but like, this is a neat one here. It gives you the ability to just put Wi-Fi on like that. That's an ESP8266, and this is a little Wi-Fi module that you can add right on to an Arduino. It takes some work, like the code isn't super easy because Arduino or because uh, Wi-Fi is not a simple standard, but you can add Wi-Fi to Arduino projects, which is really cool. So this is an entire ecosystem of things that you can attach. And the way that I would say you learn about them is, is not by um, trying to read up on them. I'd say go find, if you know that you want to have something like if you want to have Bluetooth audio, you could say Bluetooth audio breakout. Like if we hop into here, Bluetooth audio breakout board, you can just do searches like this and then you're going to find all sorts of 
Bluetooth audio receiver board, Bluetooth stereo music player module, you can start to find different Bluetooth things or Bluetooth breakouts right here in, in this SparkFun space. SparkFun, I would say, probably makes the most breakouts uh, as, a, as a manufacturer. And so you've got all of these different things that they make that you can play with to try and get access to interesting pieces. They really push, um, I, over the years, SparkFun has developed as a bit more of an engineering bend thing. Uh, like they sell FPGA boards, which are really fascinating. Uh, chips that, that are more complicated, I would say, than we should get into right now. But there's all sorts of interesting pieces. Like this is a, a LoRa gateway. So here's your, your um, this is that, I believe that's the low power Wi-Fi that, that is being hosted and uh, by some of the Make Haven members, the long range radio messages. So you could add this to your Arduino projects if you're interested in having LoRa capabilities for long range Wi-Fi. So those are all interesting pieces that if you're interested in this, this is a good way to make it happen with just a little bit of wiring or putting it into a breadboard. Usually there's like documentation and here's the schematic, Eagle files, a hookup guide, and then a firmware and a library. Usually because a breakout board like this is made by a company, they're gonna have a bunch of info for you so that you can play around and like get, get that connected, get it hooked up. And you can see all of these different pieces that are in play so that you can make sense of it. And Adafruit, if they have a breakout, would be just as well documented. Other, other companies, the, those are the two major American companies that I'm aware of that do a really nice job with this so that they can be really clear about what's happening. And so here's this LoRa thing with a gateway that connects to the internet. It's a neat, it's a neat platform. So you can have a ton of different breakouts that add all sorts of functionality to a project. And so you really can do some interesting stuff. Um, that's a, that's a good question. For logic level shifters to go back and forth, it's sort of a weird thing and you, you'll, you might realize that you need one if you've got something that you attach that needs five volts to work, but whatever you're using as a, if you're using a Raspberry Pi that only outputs three and a half. The logic level shifter boards are maybe $2. You can make one yourself with just a few transistors, but that's, that's gotta be its own whole discussion because then you're getting into the circuits of how that works. These are nice because they're kind of solved problems, not quite as much as a shield. You just wire up. This would be the high voltage side on the left and on the top, I guess. And these are the low voltage sides on the bottom. So you could just wire up the low voltage side and the high voltage side. And it's like a thing that goes in the middle, the middle of the wires and it should just work. These, these breakouts down across the bottom are really nice ones to have. These are for stepper motors. This is a relay. So if you want to turn on and off a lamp in your house, like a full wall power lamp, you're going to do it with a relay. And then this is a motor driver board. So if you want to drive a motor and you, you want to make sure that you're not taxing your Arduino, a little board like this works really well. And I've definitely done it. This would run two DC motors. This is an L298. It's really good for driving two motors or one, two brushed DC motors or one stepper motor. So there's, there's a bunch of different breakouts. It's a whole menu that you, you really should roll through if you're interested. And I'll, I can put some links to good ones in, in the Slack chat, but there's tons and tons and tons of these. Now, if, you've got, if you're thinking about sort of shields, which are complete packages that do a lot of things and have many pieces integrated, and then breakout boards are sort of smaller focused on one part of what might be a shield, uh, a, LoRa is its own is like a long range Wi-Fi, and so it's it's Wi-Fi that reaches out over a longer distance. It's pretty limited availability right now, but I know that there's a Make Haven person that's that's trying to make that bigger and more available in New Haven. We can have a longer discussion about that in a little while. And then bare components. So if we're thinking about shields and then breakout boards, the last piece that needs to be mentioned are bare components. So if you're doing electronics projects, the cheapest option to make an electronics project is if you know how to wield the bare components themselves. And so this is going to be much, much cheaper by like 10 times cheaper. And that, that big gap is why it's so profitable to have a, par, a, a company like Adafruit or SparkFun, because they can buy these parts wholesale, put them together, make their boards, do their testing, and then put out all that educational material and it's still such a large profit margin to have and manage these things because they're small, it's not a lot of storage, that they, 
remove all the skill. They let hobbyists buy it. And for a reasonable price, you know, at the end of the day, if a breakout is $10, I would still say that that's, that could be a good price for a particular breakout, but it would, it would be like 10 times the price of the bear component, but it takes maybe one tenth of the skill. So if you're, if you know your electronics and we're talking, this is a deep dive, you can go way into a full career of just learning these things, then you can really cheapen your entire piece. It's also uh, surface mount devices are another good reason why bare components are tough to put into electronics. These are the really small devices, the most modern devices, um, and they are great to have, but they don't fit really nicely into the holes or the pins that are available on an Arduino. So you might need a breakout or something to get those connected. Another thing about bare components is that data sheets that come with them are really a treasure trove of information, but they can be really hard to read and manage. But uh, I, I would say it's definitely like the old campers adage of the more you know, the less you need. The more you learn about electronics, the, the closer and closer you can get to just running on bare components. And then the more you understand bare components, the easier it will be to build your own circuit boards if you wanna design your own things from scratch. So there's tons of different layers that you can go at this with. And it's 100% the right move to start with shields and hats and wings, things that are sort of solve problems, and then work your way down these levels of, of, of like logic and detail that, so that when you get down to the lowest level logic, the lowest level detail, and you're looking at bare components, you're, you're able to really know what's happening with each one of those. But it's, it's a progression. I started with shields and then sort of worked my way down. That's what I would solidly recommend for everybody is don't try and just jump right into bare components unless you really already know what you're doing. Then our next, our next thing is let's talk about soldering. Soldering is a way that you can, if you're looking to make it down that progression from shield to breakout to bare components, the main thing that's gonna be the barrier is soldering. And so soldering in general has its entire own ecosystem of tools and terms and things to do. And so soldering in general is a skill that's, it's a technical skill, but it's also a touch of an art, right? It's something that you can get certified in. You can get IPC, ICP certified, one of those. I've got a link right here, but you can get certified in soldering for soldering through hole for soldering surface mount and soldering certain sizes of surface mount. So you can be an expert and be employed just for hand soldering. That's probably going away as we get better at automating the soldering process, but they'll always need to be some people who are building prototypes by hand. And so that's a really important thing. If you're going to solder in Makehaven, there's no badge for the soldering stations and we just clean them up. There's three soldering irons that are all over there in that corner. And we've spaced them out as much as we can so that you can have some space if you wanted to be there in the same time and in the same place. It's really good to know the names of some of your tools, like the solder station is the power supply at the bottom. There's a, a soldering pen or a soldering wand, the pen stand. Sometimes people use a wet sponge, but I like a brass sponge to scrape off the end of the soldering iron. The solder looks kind of like a wire, but it's really bendy. Um, and so that's, that's good to know about. Then there's the solder sucker that's there. Ooh, the Weller soldering station is, is a really good, is a really good point. The Weller, Weller is my favorite brand for solder stations. There's a, there's a bunch of good ones. I think Hacko is another one that's really nice, but the Wellers at Makehaven, I, I have to say are both really good with nice digital displays. Your soldering is going to happen at about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry for all of the Celsius natives among us. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, um, but it's enough that our solder is gonna work. There's many different types of solder. Uh, oh, a good question. Why would you get certified? If you wanted it to be part of your job, you could get sort of like, you can be a certified machinist in different ways. You can say that you're a certain level of machinist. You can say that you're a certain level of person who can solder, solderer, which is a weird word in all the ways. Um, but soldering like this, this is pretty like pretty normal electronic solder, although I definitely have thinner stuff that I like to use. Um, and the thinner, the better for most electronics, especially when your parts get smaller. We're going to start off with through hole because it's easier. You don't need it, it's the it's the right thing to do first for this graph up here. I just sort of made this graph up, but you're going to start off and it's going to be a struggle when you start soldering. 
You're going to have a rough couple of weeks, a rough couple of times, and then you will steadily get better. As you get better and better at soldering, there's a ton of different, um, there's a ton of really nice things to get better at soldering doing. There's, there's solder practice. As you do more and more, you're going to get better and better at it. And it may feel impossible to solder on little teeny tiny pieces like are in here, like these little guys, but most of these you could definitely solder on by hand. And so as you get better at soldering with through hole pieces, like the ones with long leads, you'll eventually get good enough that you can try your hand at surface mount. And it, and it may feel like they're too small to deal with, but just a little bit of fine motor skill and you're good to go. You can totally make those surface mount things happen. And so once you get good at through hole, give surface mount a try. It's definitely a good way to level up your soldering game. And it brings in a ton of new things that you have access to. The one secret to making that happen though, is that flux and rosin are absolutely essential for being better at soldering. Flux is this liquid and I've got a few different versions of flux here. There's runny flux, runny flux. There's like a paste kind of flux. There's a bunch of different ways that flux can present. I particularly like the runny stuff or like these flux pens where you draw it on, but it, what it does is it removes the oxide layer from the, the metals that you're gonna try and solder together. It, it doesn't leave it pretty, but it cleans it off so that the solder goes to where it should go. And so it's a really helpful piece. The, the art of soldering is definitely something that we should look at instead of just talk about. And so I've got this video that I queued up, it's totally muted, um, but it gives us something to look at where great Scott, fantastic YouTube video. You should totally go watch this thing in its entirety. He's gonna walk us through soldering a few different pieces. And so watching someone solder really close up gives you an idea of what to look for. You wanna be looking at these pins, how they poke through a board. He's got them on a proto board is what we're gonna see in a second. But these are just different chip arrangements and they're, they're different sizes, different types of chips. For right now, that doesn't matter too much. But one of the tricks for soldering is that you wanna have your pins through the board that you're attaching them to. And then there he's got his iron that's gonna heat up the pad and the pin, and then you bring in the solder. It sort of wicks in and turns into what should be a shiny Hershey Kiss shape. That's what you're going for. Watching it many times and then practicing it many times is really essential to get it right. It's not gonna happen right for the first, I don't know, 50, 100 solder joints. It's gonna take a while to get it well, to get it right. It should just take a second or two. This is not sped up, it's not slowed down. This is just the speed of soldering because he definitely knows what he's doing. Um, and so there's, there's little tricks here, like instead of directly soldering the chip, you should probably solder the socket. If you've soldered something and you want to unsolder it, solder braid like this or, or rosin braid like this is really great. It needs to have flux on it, but you can use it to remove solder. You can see the solder will sort of wick up into that copper braid, watch it going into that copper braided space, it sort of fills in the gaps and it pulls right out of those joints. It's almost magical how well it works. A solder sucker also re really works well for this, which uses sort of a vacuum pressure to pull it off, but it's totally worth it to watch this guy and listen to him talk about doing it because it works for that little socket. It works for larger components. This is exactly what you should be working for if you're trying to do soldering yourself. I have, I have and, a question. Yeah. I'm noticing that he's just like, YOLO pressing the soldering iron against the board. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was kind of ginger and, and worried about maybe like hurting something. Like, can you just like do that all the time? Like our boards yeah. meant to, to take that because that would certainly make it much easier. So that's a really good question. And I would say that that is where, <laughs> um, I saw a comment, control Z for solder, that'd be great. But the, <laughs> <laughs> the, Circuit boards vary in how high quality they are when they're made. So I've gotten some really high quality boards, like the boards that you all got for the, the tester shield. That one's a, a high quality board specifically so that it's easier to do your desoldering. If you have a really low quality board and the copper layer is not that well adhered to the thing below, it is possible to sort of bake it off. Hopefully you, your, your hold, your, your setup is good enough that that's not your struggle the first few times. Like it's probably worth it to spend an extra couple of dollars for your learn to solder kits so that you don't have a bad board that's compounding the problem of learning how to solder. The ones that we picked are specifically designed so that they're the nicer quality 
we did a couple upgrades so that it's easier to solder for you at the start. It's totally worth it. So you can focus on the skill rather than is my part to blame. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You should be able to heat up the board. The, FR, the FR4 board is like a fiber board that's glue, it's epoxy and fiberglass. And so it's gonna act as sort of an insulator to keep your components a little bit safe from the heat of the iron. It's not a perfect guard, so you can't just leave it there for forever. He's had like one or two second contacts and that's really what you're going for is to try and hit this contact where he's, he's touching with the soldering iron for like one, two, three, and then cut off, but like one, two, three seconds. So you, you don't wanna have a long run where you're there for a long time. Too much heat, some components really won't tolerate it well. Resistors are gonna be fine. Uh, some, some buttons, some big beefy buttons will be okay. Things where metal is directly held in place by plastic. If you heat up the metal too much, it'll melt the plastic around it. And then, and then you've got a bad day. A MOSFET like this, sometimes they're totally fine with a lot of heat. Sometimes they're more sensitive. The data sheet would tell you, but basically you want the least amount of time that you can do to get it to work, which I know isn't, isn't that helpful. You just wanna try and use the least amount of heat you can to get the connection you want. And hopefully it works well. But this guy's totally just running through, throwing things in there, touching it gently, and then using that to, to bring his connections together. And so he's doing lots of different tricks. One of the big ones that you wanna look out for is that he's using actively solder bridges. So I would call these solder bridges where he's linking one hole to the next. And he's doing that to make his electrical connections instead of adding extra wires. Well, he does that sometimes. But uh, these bridges, if you're doing it deliberately, they're great. They're a really nice way for your proto board to connect things together. If they're accidental, that can be really problematic, right? That's a short circuit and you've got to be careful for those. But it's definitely something that's worth playing with, looking at his form. This, this particular guy's form of soldering is, I would say, a really neat version of soldering because it requires the least amount of extra wires. It also is some clever planning to make a circuit work like this, but he does this a lot for YouTube, I'm pretty sure professionally. So there's a, there's a ton of little pieces to think about this. Your first soldering projects are not gonna be that complicated. This video goes on to talk about how you do SMD soldering, but I figure that's not a thing for this week. Let's, let's just try and do one, one battle at a time. Uh, so there's that. And then we go on to what's next. Let's talk about wires and perf board. So there's a few different types of wires. Well, there's many different types of wires and it's good that we know sort of the, the key players. There's braided and solid core, I would say are the two main types of wires to look out for. Solid core wire is like the stuff in the top right, where it's just one wire fiber and it's just a solid piece of wire. Solid 22 American wire gauge size is perfect for breadboards and Arduino. So it's totally what I keep here at home. I have a box of that size and that's absolutely what I would recommend. Braided wire has a lot of little threads and it's better for carrying lots of current. Uh, it's better for carrying the same size wire can carry more current if it's braided, but that's usually not what it's for. Usually people choose braided wire because it's very flexible. It's more flexible than a solid core of the same size. So if you need your wires to bend and move, that's a good reason to choose braided core wire. These jumpers that, that, come, that came with your Arduino kit they're braided core throughout the middle so that they're nice and bendy, but then the ends are soldered onto a solid pin so that they work well on a breadboard. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, but they are like a, a moderately bougie upgrade to a wire. Right? A bare wire is just gonna be a solid core wire or a, a braided wire. These have fancy end caps. And then this is coaxial wire. This is something for cable TV or like analog signals that come communicating through you might need not for an Arduino or Raspberry Pi project are you gonna bump into needing a coaxial cable. But it's good to know that those are other, there are other type of cables that exist out there um, or this exists. This helps fight interference is why they use it because the, the conductor on the inside and the outside will sort of cancel each other out so they don't interfere with each other. So that's, that's why they use it to get cable to and from houses. Um, so I would say that for this week, we're gonna stay in this breadboard perf board space for our projects, that's where I would recommend that we try and live. There's definitely some art to using both of these, 
but I would say just want to, you should stay in that camp unless you have purchased something that you're going to use that's an ordered uh, made for you or made in advance PCB. But if you're trying to build your own stuff, I would say stick in these two areas. The breadboard is great for testing. And then a perf board is a good way to take something that you've tested and try and make it semi-permanent or, or permanent. I've definitely had lots of projects in life that have stopped at a perf board and I've never gone further up through this progression. A perf board is a perfectly reasonable way to get a circuit in a permanent state. So if you just need to build one of them, that's exactly how you should do it. It's just a perf board most of the time. Uh, the milled PCBs are for when you wanna try and do surface mount things, but at about the same scale. And so those are their own battle to take on later. But how do you do that, right? What's the next step? A perf board or a proto shield is a really good way to do that. I actually really love a proto shield for Arduino projects, which is a shield specifically designed to have like a perf board on top of the Arduino. These are usually not too expensive because there's really nothing on them. It's just a board and maybe a couple components and they give you access to the pins of the Arduino. So you could route wires or you could do little jumpers. There's a few different ways that you can make the connections that you want to. Uh, I like this one because it's got a five volt and a ground line right down the middle because you'll probably need a bunch of those. But here you could solder in like five or 10 buttons if you needed it or a bunch of LEDs. They give you opportunity to attach your electronics to the Arduino, but then the whole shield can still lift off, right? So that you can remove the Arduino if you need to. If for some reason you fry it and you need to replace it, you totally can, you just swap it out. Although it might be good to try and figure out why it died uh, before you do that. And here's a Canadian nickel just for, just as a tip of the hat to JR, where, <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right, and then the last bit, here's, here's one more piece. Uh, I've gotten a few questions this past week about power and batteries. So I think it's totally worth it just to say that there's, there are these two different ways to power the projects that we're gonna take on. There's wall power, which is what I strongly endorse for beginners. And then there's batteries. So wall power, you'll need a transformer, something like a wall wart or there's the, the charge brick. There's a lot of different names for these, but you'll need something like this in order to charge up a project. And so, and, and you could even plug your Arduinos right into the USB of a computer if you're gonna always be near a computer. So a, a charger like this is gonna give you nice consistent power. It'll be reliable as long as there's power from the plug, it'll work. And usually these can supply a variable amount of current. So if you have an unusually high current draw that happens every so often, these can be really great. Or if you have a thousand LEDs, you get a big power supply for it. You can make that happen from the wall power. If you wanna use batteries, then you're introducing all of the weirdness of battery chemistry, which is really helpful for being on the go, but I'm definitely trying to be a downer on batteries right now because they are their own entire headache. Uh, up here on the top, there's alkaline batteries, then there's lead acid batteries, and then there's lipo batteries, and there's nickel metal hydride. There's a ton of battery chemistries, each with their own thing. They can give you different amounts of current. That was the thing that I was worried about when talking with somebody this week about a big LED project is how much current are they gonna be pulling and would a nine volt battery give them enough current? Sort of as you move down the line in alkaline batteries from D down to here's quadruple A, and then inside of a nine volt battery, you've got six of those little quadruple A batteries. So this is a nine volt opened up. Here's six little cells or here's six like a pancake or another six like a pancake. The smaller the cell is, the less current it can deliver. And so in an alkaline battery, nine volts are good for having nine volts in a small package, but they can't give you much power, much current at the same time. So they're good for smoke detectors that do almost nothing for very long periods of time. And then every so often need a big burst. That's the perfect use for a nine volt battery. Um, if you wanna sustain a lot of power, that's a good lead acid battery game. And so those are useful in cars where they can give a ton of current all in one shot to start up the engine with the starter motor. And then they can spend a lot of time recharging while the car runs. So lead acid batteries can be really useful for that. A sealed lead acid battery is actually a really nice thing. There's lead in them, so that's bad. And acid, which is also not great, but they're super useful and I've totally carried them around in a backpack for projects before. They can be handled safely and, and they're, pretty, they're pretty darn stable. LiPos are really great. If you wanna build a drone or an RC car, a lithium polymer battery is the way you're gonna do it. And they usually come in these sort of squishy packets, which is really cool that they can be whatever shape you want. And they have a wide range of current rates that they can give. Um, 
but you need to do some legwork and research to figure out how you wanna use these and be careful about charging and, and storing them. If you have a power supply down here at the very bottom, there's this little tiny text that says what its output voltage and current is. Definitely, if you have a spare junk drawer of power supplies, read your DC outputs and see what you've got. You might have a treasure trove of things that are useful for Arduino that you didn't even know about. We definitely use them at Make Haven. They're totally all over the place. And I'd be happy to show you how to hack one apart so that you can make it useful for your next project. Um, also batteries themselves, just as we're talking about batteries, they have their entire whole science to make them work. It's basically a chemical reaction in a can. And that's a really fun way to think about them. But it, but it kind of means that they're like little tiny athletes. They can get tired out. They're good at marathon running. They're not good at sprinting usually. And so they're better if you use a long, low current draw out of them. Uh, there's only a few types of batteries that are really good at dumping out lots of power. So like a, a lead acid battery is a sprinter or a lipo is a sprinter, but an alkali battery is more like a, a cross country runner. It can go for a long time with a low draw, but it's not gonna do a whole lot that's more aggressive than that. And so it's really an interesting dynamic as you start to build projects that need batteries, you're gonna wanna explore this. And it's definitely something that can be done relatively easily, but you need to, it needs to be, it's, it's tricky, but every time you've used a battery in your life and it's been super easy, like pop two triple A's into the TV remote and it just works. That's because somebody figured it out and made sure that that was gonna be easy for you, the end user. You've gotta be ready to take on the extra bit of complexity that using a battery really requires. And so using a rechargeable battery is definitely something that has to be taken into account. Um, Here's, here's an entire piece on how do you charge, how do you store, and how do you dispose of rechargeable batteries because they have their entire own dynamic. For an alkaline battery, those are primary batteries. Uh, they get used once and then thrown away. A secondary battery, you have to manage actively how it's recharged. Your cell phone's battery does that for you. It's all engineered in there so that they manage it. Here's a puffy cell phone battery for where it mismanaged it. This is when things go wrong inside your cell phone and the charging circuits aren't, aren't going right. Uh, normally you don't have to think about it at all, but the batteries are all managed for you on your own. If you're buying LiPo batteries, like for drones or RC cars, you'll probably know that you need a LiPo safe like this to store them in, because and it's a fireproof bag. You don't want them to, uh, they can catch fire if they're held in an A-stable way. Rechargeable batteries like this are actually great. I've absolutely used them. You can be very successful, but it's one of the things that I wanna say, don't just assume that you can slap one in there and it'll work. The only exception, and this is probably the best argument for an Adafruit Feather, is that Adafruit built in basically just as nice of software and hardware for managing charging LiPo batteries as a cell phone has. And so the Adafruit Feather really does do a nice job of solving this for you for LiPo batteries specifically. And so if you wanted to do rechargeable batteries, I would definitely point you in the direction of an Adafruit Feather because it manages every bit of that, 100%. Um, and then there's fancy chargers like this that I've totally used when I had students who wanted to build robots, needed to build robots, and then they wanted to manage the batteries and charge and, and run their hovercrafts or whatever it was. So. Chargers like this are really helpful, but these run at like $80 a, a pop or so. They're a good way to manage batteries and charge them and, and drain and, and get them peaked just right. But they do require a little bit of extra work, more than you might expect. Um, also, good news, just as some legwork. In New Haven, there is recycling for electronics recycling because you can't throw anything but alkaline batteries directly in the trash. And Home Depot will also take batteries for recycling. So those are all interesting things that you have to keep in mind if you're gonna bring in rechargeable batteries. There's lots of good reason to do it. You just need to be ready to think that it's its own whole other thing. So it's probably not a good idea for this week to think about using rechargeable batteries. If you can use wall power, that's the way to go. I can definitely help you with rechargeable batteries, but don't just assume it's gonna be a, a no problem addition. Um, and then just to, be, just to be clear for the sake of, of example, Boston Dynamics, who makes these giant robots that do all sorts of fun things. And if you haven't seen this video, it's pretty great. This is Do You Love Me with Robots Dancing. 
Boston Dynamics builds these giant robots that will be our robot overlords at some point. And even when they're testing their first round projects, their earliest versions, they all were tethered with power. So over here with this yellow oval, you can see that there's a, a big heavy cord running to the robot. That's all the power that it needs to run. It's also tethered to the ceiling. Your very first projects, you shouldn't try and worry about batteries, just power them from the wall. Your life will be a lot easier. And then eventually you'll get to this where the robot's able to do some dancing. And it's, you know, it's a little scary, but it's kind of fun. Uh, oh, is Boston Dynamics owned by Google? <laughs> no, this is totally for real, by the way. These dancing robots are completely fine. I looked up this yellow guy. He's $74,500 to buy without any attachments. Um, I, don't, I didn't look up how much it is to buy the humanoid ones. But this is completely a real thing. This was released like last week just to showcase the, the power that they've gotten to, the ability that they're at. The little yellow guy is really sold mostly for like search and rescue things or a few other applications where maybe a building collapsed and you need to go in where it's dangerous to find if there's people in there before you send in other humans to, to do some repair work or to, to get them out. And so there's, there's tons of different, I think they've actually sent in several of those to the Fukushima power plant in Japan to see how that was going before they sent in anybody to deal with it. Um, so there's a, for transporting things. Yeah, there's there's tons of information about all of this. They're, yeah, they're largely demilitarized. There's a ton of information. It's a fascinating thing. This is not where you should aspire for your first Arduino projects to be. They're great examples. Don't try and build this in a week. It's not gonna happen. This company started in 1992 and there's a ton of interesting things that they built, but it takes all that time and all that brain power to make it happen. Let's see. So how, how would you get started, right? Instead of focusing on those giant robots, where are we gonna go? My sincere advice is that your first project should be something that you think is too easy for you. You wanna absolutely pick something that you think is beneath you, that doesn't seem like it, it meets the tier of what you wanna do, because taking the project from beginning to end is trickier than you think. Uh, Carolyn, my wife is definitely, given me some advice from improv that easy plus easy equals hard. And so that's a common piece of advice from improv comedy that if you do a couple of things that seem like they'd be easy on their own and you bring them together, it's not going to be so easy anymore. So definitely you want to choose the easiest thing you can go after for your first project. Just doing that is going to definitely be in the right direction. If you take on a big thing for this first week of doing electronics, it may quickly snowball out of where you wanted to, to land. So how do you even identify if it's a good starter project? These are, the, these are the things that I would definitely look for. Full instructions with pictures, a bill of materials for what you wanna buy, circuit diagrams with pictures of the breadboards or the perf boards are really, really helpful. If there's code that's pre-written, like an example sketch or a library or stuff like that, that basically you're just tweaking or maybe not even really touching at first, you're just gonna upload it and it'll kind of work. That's really helpful. If there's an STL or laser files that'll make it really easy to complete the, the housing for it, that's even better. And one piece of warning is that a video is a great place to learn about a project, but it's not enough documentation to build a whole project as a good starter. Definitely as you get more advanced, you'll look at videos and there'll be inspirations that get you going. Um, but for a starter project, you want a full set of instructions, not just a video. And so definitely you wanna go nice and, and easy on the first one. You don't wanna take it too hard. You want something that's completely laid out for you and just bring it full circle, start to finish. Again, too easy is where we're going for this. So here are my project suggestions. Uh, here's a list of 12 that, that could be somewhat reasonable depending on where your experience is before you show up to this week. So if you're already good, maybe you look at the moderate. If you're not already a rock solid at Arduino, don't do the moderate ones this week. The suggestions I would have is use a platform that you already know, stick to less than 50 LEDs because you don't wanna to have to manage the power part. You want it to be relatively simple on the power side. Uh, brushed motors, which are the simple motors and servos are gonna be the easiest ways to add motion to a project, especially servos. Um, code with only a couple of libraries is really a good 
a good suggestion just because they add complexity in the code and it can be kind of hard to track that. I'll, again, don't use batteries in this first project. If you can avoid it, try and use DC adapters. Batteries with the right attachment. So if you've got an Adafruit circuit playground, uh, that's gonna manage it just fine. If you have an Adafruit feather, that's gonna manage a battery just fine. But don't try and use a battery with an Arduino project right away. There's some complexity there. Same thing for a Raspberry Pi. With Raspberry Pi, you can do like those battery backup banks. They work pretty well, but they're big clunky things that have attached to your Raspberry Pi, like the cell phone charger battery banks. And then also go for easy-ish easy sensors to understand. But here's just a list. And this is literally going through Instructables and looking at a whole list of things, like an optical theremin. This one is a neat uh, starter project that's got an Arduino and just a couple of simple sensors. And you make an instrument that you move your hand around the thing and it makes different sounds based on your hand movement. Uh, there's this bubble steam bubble machine, which I actually really love. Um, it's just a couple of servos and a fan and it just sort of dips into the bubble juice, brings it over with two little servos and then a fan blows bubbles. It's a charming little bubble machine. I think that's a great starter project. It's got all the pieces of fun and whimsy that a good starter Arduino project should have. Um, there's tons of other ones that are really cool. The binary clock, this is a really neat one. Uh, binary is a good way to express small numbers. And this one has a circuit board that's pre-made in some cases. Sometimes there's that, sometimes they're a little bit easier. And so you wanna see what's going on here with a few of them. The, there's word clocks that come in various different levels. This one I particularly liked because it's a 3D print file and you just 3D print things to make it happen for the housing. So if you're already good at 3D printing, that can be nice and straightforward. And then they use LED strips so that they're not trying to do matrices. They're not doing other things. These are addressable LEDs. And so you could just buy a few pieces and put it together and it shouldn't be too hard, fingers crossed. So there, there are some, oh, and they're not strips, they're individual ones that they solder together but the idea is still pretty much the same. So there's a ton of different options for how you can do relatively easy starter projects, but my, a good suggestion for just about everybody for building a project is to do the example Arduino shield. Because a shield like this one, and this is the shield that, I've, that I had made for all of us, is gonna be good practice at soldering. It's got inputs and outputs, so the encoder the potentiometer and this light sensor and the button, those are all inputs to play with. And then you've got these, it looks like two, but it's really four LEDs that you can output things to. There's code that exists so that you can solder this together, just doing the practice soldering and then play with the code to modulate how would you relate these things back and forth. Again, this may feel like not really a full project, but remember, too easy is what we're going for. You don't want something that's complicated you want something that's a nice starter that gets you into the space that makes it feel possible to solder all these things together and to make it happen. So you definitely wanna go for that. Also this not connected pin, if you don't have a pin there, it doesn't matter. Um, but that's definitely what we wanna go, what we wanna go after for, all, for some of these projects. This is totally a good starter, but there's tons of them. I put together a big list. They're all on the projects and boards website. There's tons of them to choose from. Uh, like another cool one is the tipping bucket rain gauge, where if you want to measure how much rain falls, this is actually a relatively simple sensor and it's more of a physical build uh, than an Arduino thing. You'd need an Arduino and a, and a magnet sensor, but it's a nice, simple way to tell if uh, how much rain falls because it fills up a bucket and then it tips so that this little bucket will tip back and forth. This guy here, when enough rain fills up here, it tips and goes that way and the magnet passes by this magnet sensor and it knows, oh, it tipped back the other way. So a certain amount of water fell and then the other side fills up and it tips back. So that's a fun way to be able to sense how much rain is falling. It's a clever little seesaw trick that you can use to measure rainfall. There's tons of interesting projects that you can go after, but choose one for this week that's too easy for you. And I wanna say that a ton of times because I want you to feel successful at the end instead of being stuck in something where you get a quarter of the way there. There's really inspiring things to do, uh, but they're, they're not the one that you wanna go after at the beginning. So with that and with all of our, that, that's the end, I wanna bring it back to here. Totally use this 
there, you should have been handed one, or I think there's three whole kits left on top of the foundation shelf so that you can grab it. And you've got a whole kit here that you would be able to solder together with your Arduino and make it happen. So there's tons of opportunity there. This would absolutely be an acceptable option for the week. But that said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, address some of these questions, um, talk about, and, and I wanna hear what everybody was up to this week because there's a ton of different things that I saw people doing. And so let's, let's see what happened. All right, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff happening around LoRa, the, the long range Wi-Fi stuff. That's a really cool area to explore a lot, a lot further. And there's, it's the thing that JR tried to sell a while back where you could, if you hooked it up and used your electricity to power it, you would get paid in a tiny, tiny fractional amount of Bitcoin. So it's a, it's a cool thing. Um, the theremin is really fun. It's a fun way to build a nice little instrument.